Good evening. Good evening and welcome to all of you who were able to join us. This is an exciting evening for us and an event that we have been looking forward to for weeks now. And we're so happy to know that you folks have been able to join us. My name is Day Bryant and I am here and you are here for our event tonight, our conversation with Barbara Smith uh, from the Combahee River Collective to Black Lives Matter. And it's going to be an exciting time as we are discussing with, with our esteemed guest as well as with one another, uh, the issues that have been a great part of all of our lives. Uh, before I, we dive into this evening, there are a couple of things that I would like to be able to talk with you about, take care of some housekeeping type issues. Uh, first of all, uh, you should have been muted when you joined us. If you were not, please do so, so that we can uh, be certain that we cut down on the background noises. Uh, we also ask you to turn off your video unless you are a panelist or um, a speaker for this evening so that we can cut down on bandwidth and maybe uh, hold down also on those times when the screens freeze and our, we can hear people talking and their face does not move. So we are trying to forestall some of those technical issues. I would like to give you an idea of the types of the, how our evening will unfold tonight. We will spend some time uh, making introductions. Uh, we will have a land acknowledgement for those of us who are here on this land and are, are not indigenous. We will then have a conversation with our, our guest, Barbara Smith. And after that conversation, we will have a Q&A. Uh, in between that time, I would like for you, those of you who have comments or questions, please drop them in chat. We will have someone who is monitoring chat and will help us to be able to bring out as many questions as possible. For those who we are, for those that we are not able to get to right now in this space, we have also created a community commons page. Uh, the link will be dropped into chat by our tech person back behind the scenes so that you can join us in a continued conversation as well as work with us as we talk about so so what what next now that we've had these this time together and have brought out all of these issues this community commons allows us to continue on with this conversation and go into action around our new 21st century kitchen table i will pause at this point so that we can do the land acknowledgement. Uh, be, and if you'll hold it for just a moment, I want to be certain that I am, I am accurate and respectful. We recognize, support and advocate for the sovereignty of Indiana's only federally recognized Indian nation, for historic indigenous communities in Indiana, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold individuals and organizations gathered here more accountable for the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. We are committed to bringing Native American voices to the forefront as part of an ongoing effort to celebrate and tell the histories and contemporary experiences of Native American people. We also recognize the Native American presence on the land where we are located, Black Lives Matter South Bend and Michiana Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, recognize and are grateful for the original peoples who laid the foundation for the city of South Bend and for the diverse indigenous nations that reside here. I will pass over to Madeline Waysaw, who will also provide a welcome. Hi, bonjour, Mijana, Madeline Waysaw, Indigenous Kaz, Mashik and Dodam, Hokaganek, Bodre Water Meat and Daw, Wazaki um, Gondochbia. Hi, my name is Madeline. Um, I am Pokega Potawatomi. Uh, my clan is Turtle and I live in St. Joseph, Michigan. Um, I am also aligned, associated with the Michiana Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, as well as the American Indian Movement chapter of Indiana and Kentucky. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to briefly thank this group for that acknowledgement. Um, and to acknowledge in turn the unity and the synergy that I've uh, 
been thankful and um, blessed enough to witness between our communities, especially in this past year. Um, I think one thing that everybody can agree on is that uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to women. Women are sacred and in particular black women for all the work that they do um, to help create a better and more just world for all of us. And rarely do they get the credit that is due to them. So tonight is a wonderful opportunity to kind of educate um, and engage in that discourse. Um, there's a saying in Indian country that a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. And then it is finished, no matter how brave its warriors or how strong its weapons. So on behalf, on behalf of the indigenous community um, and the Alliance who co-sponsored this event tonight, I'd like to say miigwech, thank you to all of the amazing women and panelists that we are going to be hearing from this evening. Excellent, thank you very much, Madeline. And at this time, and without further ado, I will make introductions to our conversant and our guest for this evening. Uh, Barbara Smith and her colleagues in the Kumbahi River Collective are credited with originating the term identity politics, defining it as an inclusive political analysis for contesting the interlocking oppressions of race, gender, class, and sexuality. Today, that term is known as intersectionality. Our Barbara Smith has been a thought leader, a publisher, and an elected official, and we welcome her this evening. Maya Perry, who will be a, a part of this conversation as well, is a member of Black Lives Matter South Bend's core group. She is also a 2021 graduate from Indiana University South Bend, where she has become a new wave of educators out there who are joining our ability to be able to educate in terms of the issues that you'll be looking at this evening. So with that, I will turn this over to Maya Smith and Barbara, or Maya Perry and Barbara Smith. Hello. Oh, hold on, I'm having a little problem. The host, you gotta turn my video back on. Thank you. And I'm just waiting. All right. <laughs> well, good evening. It is so, it is, it is a wonderful experience to be able to be having this conversation with you tonight, Barbara. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. And I just want you to know that you are continually inspiring me and my path as an educator and a whole new generation of activists, of young queer black women. And so with that, let's get into this discussion. So can you speak a little bit about the conditions that necessitated the creation of the Combahee River Collective and how it's, it was different from the mainstream feminist and queer liberation movement at the time? You're muted. Thank you so much, Maya. And I just wanted to thank um, all of you who've made it possible for me to be with you this evening. Uh, the Michiana Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression and Black Lives Matter South Bend. And I also, that uh, land acknowledgement was beautiful. Uh, I am in Albany, New York. This is Mohawk and Mohican land and also it is land that was a part of the Iroquois Confederacy from which those who think they founded this country, of course, we know that was not really the case, but for those who uh, thought they found, uh, founded the country and invented democracy, they got, all, they got those ideas from the Iroquois Confederacy. So the conditions under which uh, we started the Combahee River Collective, um, keep, keep in mind, this was the 1970s and uh, it was not at all easy to assert oneself as a black feminist. Um, certainly not easy to be out uh, as a lesbian. And that's what we were doing at a time when our various identities were under great uh, attack. And 
um, we were we, uh, we were originally a chapter of the National Black Feminist Organization, which had its first Eastern Regional Conference in New York City in uh, November of 1973. Both my sister Beverly and I attended that conference and we then were charged with, she lived in New York at the time, but uh, we were charged with those of us who attended and there were hundreds of uh, black women who attended that conference. We were charged with going back to our respective home cities and starting chapters of the National Black Feminist Organization, which indeed we did um, in the city of Boston. And then about a year or so later, uh, by the spring or summer of 1975, we decided that we be, would become an independent organization. And we decided to name ourselves after the Combahee River in South Carolina, which is actually pronounced Cumbi, found that out quite late in life, but that river in South Carolina, because it is where Harriet Tubman, who was a scout for the Union Army, led a raid on the Combahee River that freed over 750 uh, Africans. So that's why it's uh, called the Combahee River Collective. One of the things about Combahee, and uh, you know, people came to us and came to the group with different experiences, but I would not say primarily that we were reacting to a predominantly white women's movement. I think it was like much more positive, uh, a more, much more positive kind of impetus was that we wanted to organize our, for ourselves and we wanted to build black feminism. So it wasn't like, you know, uh, black, uh, white women have treated us so wretchedly, you know, we have to, you know, go somewhere else and do something else. It was that the only people who could actually create something called a black feminist movement and black feminism were of course, we ourselves. So that was, uh, that was what we uh, started to do. And uh, I think people have some familiarity with the things that we believed. And uh, that's because of the Combahee River Collective Statement. And I'll just stop there and I'm sure we'll get into other things. So I, I, I think that um, I'm not sure if you maybe answered this, but you know, how, how was it different? Like, how was it different from the queer liberation movement at the time? Well, Maya, there was no queer liber liberation movement. <laughs> I'm always, because I'm a word person and because I studied English. Uh, on Words the grad, matter. Well, both in college and uh, on the graduate level with the goal, the objective of teaching African-American literature. That was what I, why I went to grad school. It wasn't to teach Europeans or you know, English you know, people from <laughs> the United Kingdom or whatever, and not even to teach white US authors. My goal was to teach African-American literature. And this was at a time when you couldn't study uh, Black literature or black, do Black studies or Black women's literature, none of that was available, uh, nor were, were third, uh, third world studies available at that time. So those of us who had the idea of teaching on the college and university level during the, those years and um, wanted to, you know, uh, pursue those things, uh, that's, we had to basically do it on our own. But as I said, I, I digress. I'm a word person. So you said queer liberation, it was not queer liberation. Queer was an insult. And it's taken many years for me to feel comfortable using the word queer because like all oppressed groups, we take back those words, turn them on their heads and use them with pride. But during that era, um, it was only a few years after Stonewall. Remember that the Stonewall Rebellion happened in 1969. And so mid 70s, that's like, that's way less than a decade after Stonewall. Things were really kind of heating up and getting started. The terms that would have been used in those days were gay liberation, the gay liberation are the, are the gay rights movement. And then because of lesbian feminism uh, and the involvement of lesbians, I think many lesbians were involved in both the women's movement and in the uh, 
uh, get, uh, the gay movement at that time, we were feminists. And so then as uh, the decade went on, it began to be the gay and lesbian movement, lesbian and gay. Um, we were not you know, really um, talking about uh, people who were bisexual very much. We were not talking, definitely we were not talking about people who were trans. Um, there have been so many captures and so many transformations uh, since the 1970s. Um, but your question was like, how was Kambahi different from whatever was going on as far as what we would now call queer organizing? Well, uh, a major difference is that we were anti-racist. Um, we were explicitly anti-racist. And the mainstream uh, gay movement at that time was not a place where most black women would, or other, our other women of color would feel comfortable, or men of color for that matter, because it was just like a very, very white thing. And it, and it has continued, you know, those kinds of issues have continued to be the case because we still have a mainstream gay movement that doesn't necessarily address the issues of people with multiply oppressed identities and with different kinds of experiences and relationships to um, what our sexual, uh, our sexual identities, our gender identities are. I mean, as people of color, we have whole um, histories of how we look at the realities of sexual and gender diversity that just are not captured within a European frame. So, um, as I said, I, I, one of the major markers would be a difference, uh, a, a difference with Kambahi is that we were anti-racist. And then also we had a class analysis. Uh, the, I always uh, say, I often say that the reason that the Kambahi River Collective and the Kambahi River Collective statement, the reason that that work, all of that work has stood the test of time is because of the fact that we are socialists and anti-capitalists. And that's why, like people say, even this week, <laughs> people have said uh, in another conversation that I was having, well, you know, when you read the Combahee River Collective Statement, it could have been written last week. It could have been written yesterday because it hits all the marks. It really does hit those marks about what's life like for people who do not have privilege in a uh, under under racial capitalism and under hetero patriarchy. That's what we were writing about. So it's not like the stuff suddenly became like kind of archaic and like strange. Um, it's still applicable, but um, we were lucky in Boston. That's where the Combahee River Collective was, as uh, I think we've already mentioned. We were fortunate because there was a lesbian and gay left in Boston. And then there was also a feminist left in Boston. There used to be women's unions all over the United States. And these were socialist feminist women's unions. There was one in the Boston area and of the various different kinds of feminism. And there were a lot of different kinds of feminism. People need to look that up and find out like all the different kinds because People sometimes describe us as uh, radical, how do they say it? Black radical feminists. And I, I, I always just say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the case. We were radical black feminists, but we were not black radical feminists. What's the distinction? The distinction is that radical feminism basically had like a kind of singular analysis of like the whole problem is patriarchy. Mm. So everything is about terrible men. And if we could just get them in, or, in order, then everything would be fine. Well, of course, for people like you and me, Maya, <laughs> and many others, this is not going to work. Um, and so like when people use this term, you know, very, in a very complimentary way, when they say that we were Black radical feminists, I said, no, 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 no. That's one version of our one variety of feminism. So we were all, as I said, we, we started by talking about the labels and the words and what was accurate. Um, but as I said, there was a lesbian and gay left in uh, Boston and there was also a leftist part of the feminist movement 
And that's who Kambahi and people in Kambahi were most likely to work with because um, we had that, that, that's who we had the most shared um, politics in common, particularly because both people in the lesbian and gay left and in the feminist left were anti-racist and also had a class analysis. Yes, and I think that when you're coalition, when you're doing coalition work, that's kind of the most important thing is making sure that you are organizing with people around your political identity rather than maybe your, your sexual or racial identity, but what are the politics of the people that I'm trying to work with? Um, because I think so often, you know, people lack that kind of analysis. And they say, you know, we are all this, this is who we're going to work with. And it's not, it doesn't really go anywhere. So. I so agree. I so agree. And um, I think that, yeah. And you already kind of got into and answered the next question, which was, <laughs> I was going to, I was going to ask, you know, why do you think this statement has had such an impact on a variety of political movements and why people find it useful today? And like you said, it's, it's written like it could have been written last week. Um, it's so, it was so much ahead of its time that it, it was able to influence all of these movements. It's, it's something that even deeply influenced myself. Like when I was starting to become more politically conscious about things, being able to read such a clear analysis of what we call intersectionality and the importance of using these multiple lenses to, I, to look at our problems. Um, but I also, some more questions for you. So well, I, I wouldn't mind well, elaborating. Did you respond, elaborate to that? No, that? I would not mind elaborating because uh, we talked about a couple of reasons, um, general reasons that Kambahi has had such impact. I think that uh, we actually, without knowing it, created a paradigm shift for how people on the left understood what the possibilities were of their struggle, of our struggle, of our shared struggle, and of that work. One of the things that we uh, used to uh, really have issues with was single issue politics, and also uh, a hierarchy of like what at that time were referred to, and probably still, as contradictions. Mm -hmm. What is a primary contradiction? So. Back in the, those days, the primary contradiction in a conventional leftist, although that sounds like an oxymoron, but in a conventional or uh, leftist uh, perspective or group, the primary contra uh, contradiction would of course be class and uh, the, an economic system that exploited people economically as a result of that. And what we were saying is that you have to look at all these systems of oppression. And there's been so much brilliant work that has been done by uh, scholars, theorists, political activists that has dug deep into how the various kinds of oppression that people experience, how they bump up against each other, how they have impact upon each other, how it's not simple, it's complex. One of the things that we say in the statement is that the uh, results of these various experiences, identities, and oppressions that is ge geometric, not arithmetic. By what we mean is you, know, you just don't do add-ons. You don't just say, well, you know, half a cup of this and half a cup of that and half a cup of the other and you know, then another half cup, and then you have this uh, recognizable cake or whatever. Uh, like it's that, it's more like a milkshake or something. <laughs> yeah, it fundamentally it, changes the yeah, way yeah, that you don't. Great. Yeah, you know, it was ice cream before, and then you put the milk and chocolate syrup in, and then it's something else. I don't know. Like, why am I talking about food? Who knows? But <laughs> well, it's something that people are familiar with, we hope. Um, <laughs> All those too many people don't have access uh, and are food insecure or starving. 
but and that's one of the things that we work on. But in any event, um, as I said, it's not so simple as just add ons. And that question, like, um, you know, black feminists often get asked of like, which of uh, your identities is more important to you and uh, the usual answer of like from from a black feminist is that when I look in the mirror, I don't just see a black person who doesn't have a gender and I don't just see a person with a gender with no race. <laughs> and you know that you just have to look at uh, how these uh, systems uh, interact and also how they impact uh, how that how they have impact on individuals about identity politics that's one of the things that uh, that we brought uh, to political discussion and political discourse but what we meant has been completely distorted and what and we weaponized. Meant it, yeah oh, oh and weaponized exactly by both the right and the left mm -hmm. go figure <laughs> and uh and what we meant was that black women have a right to determine and shape our own political agendas. That's all that we meant. And we were saying that based upon our identity as people who are simultaneously black and women, working class, and most, uh, not everybody involved with the collective was a uh, lesbian, but you know, of with sex, you know, taking into account our sexuality, whatever that was, um, that we wanted to be able to do political work that was useful to and, and relevant to what we were experiencing. So a black political agenda with no attention paid to gender, or a women's political agenda with no attention paid to race, that wasn't going to work for us. So we just, you know, use the term identity politics and it has taken on a life of its own in the intervening decades. So, you know, that's what happens sometimes. I don't believe that people on the right who use the term have ever heard of Kambahe or have ever read the statement. I don't think they got it from there. It's two words, identity politics. I think that people who resent the idea that people who have identities that they do not consider to be of value, um, contested identi identities, however we wish to describe those identities, uh, people who do not like that and who resent that, I think they could put together those two words and say, those people think their identities are important and they're building politics based on that. We hate them. <laughs> yeah, how dare they? <laughs> we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna dog them, we're gonna dog them from one end of the earth to the other. And then people on the left, I don't think that they necessarily are familiar with Kambahi either because they, they certainly don't seem like they are when they do the attacks. Now, some of them actually have read the Kambahi River Collective Statement and they disparage it. Though I really, you know, that's really challenging for me because they actually read the statement and then they dismiss it. But, what know, is it about, about the state own. that you feel that they dismiss, like that's contested for them, the multiple kind of the looking at the ways of interlocking? Inter, of the interlocking. statement is challenging. The st uh, sorry to interrupt, Maya. Oh, no, no. The state, yeah, the statement is challenging. Um, it's basically saying to people, whatever you thought it was, it's not necessarily that. And um, one of the things I love about the statement is that it has had impact on movements that don't have anything to do really with black feminism. That it has had impact on um, all kinds of movements. Uh, there's a book that I constantly recommend and I will misstate the title because, I mean, I'll mistake the subtitle. I will not mistake, misstate the, um, the full title. I, I will not mistake. Uh, I will not mistake the main title. So the main title is "Remaking Radicalism," and I think it's a, pe a people's documentary. These are some of the words: a people's documentary <laughs> history of the United States from uh, 1973 to 2001. It's edited by Dan Berger and Emily Hobson. And I'm sorry if I 
garbled the subtitle. Um, clearly, it has some uh, kind of homage to Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. But this is a documentary, uh, a documentary history. And what's so fascinating about it is that that's a period in US history when people don't think much was happening politically, particularly on the left. And this book, which came out last fall, this book actually uh, puts the kibosh or whatever that word is on that notion. There was much work going on, as I said, 1973 to 2001. And the two co-editors, actually, they start the book with the Comedy Who River Collective Statement. And they're like, I think at least 90 or maybe 100 documents in this book. And the one that they think that people should start with to start their thinking about an intersectional way and an, and an inclusive way of doing political work in solidarity in coalition, they actually think that it's comedy. <laughs> so that just shows, and there's all kinds of documents. I mean, there's there are people working on prison and mass incarceration. There are people who are working on climate and uh, environmental issues. There are people who are working on uh, disability issues. They're doing international solidarity work. All kinds of articles in this book, which are actual documents from movements, not as told to, but what people were writing at the time. But it's really, a, I think, an honor that they saw the statement and the work of Kambahi in that way. But um, it's not, it's a living document. I feel like it's a living document and we continue to do that work and struggle. I agree. I just added that to my book list. So Black Lives Matter considers Ella Baker to be a foremother of our movement. And we know that you admire her work as well. So can you share with uh, what this current generation of activists can learn from her? Well, if you really want to know about Ella Baker, again, here's another book for you. People joke about the fact that they, they can never get out of a conversation with me without getting at least one book recommendation. So I'm remaining true to form this evening. Why should I change now? Um, but um, uh, the definitive biography of Ella Baker is by Barbara Ransby. And that's where you can find out much about her. And there are other resources too. There's at least one film. I think there's more than one film about her at this time. She, one of the things about her that is so admirable to me is that she was extreme. She had extreme humility. She was not about the spotlight. She was not about getting the credit. She was not about being the center of attention. Now, she was also a Black cisgendered woman in the early 20th century into the mid late 20th century. She died in uh, the 1980s. But uh, had, had she had that kind of perspective, it's not clear how far she could have gotten with a, a perspective about wanting to be the center of attention and the spotlight because of course, black women, even though we built most of this stuff or much of this stuff, Every we, were not we were not, yes, we were not allowed to have those kind of visible leadership roles. As you, if you look back to the long, the history of the long civil rights movement of uh, the 1950s, 60s, for, well, it's like 40s, 50s, and 60s. But you will see that that time of charismatic leadership and visible national leadership, it was all male. And we now know about people like Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer uh, and uh, many others who really kept uh, all of that uh, very much vital and alive. So uh, she had great humility. Uh, she said that strong uh, people do not lead, need strong leaders, that it's more important for people to be empowered, people on the ground to be empowered. One of the things that she did, she worked with most of the uh, major civil rights uh, legacy, as they now call them, legacy organizations uh, in her lifetime before she was the catalyst for the formation of SNCC the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I'll say a little bit more about SNCC in a moment, but uh, in her uh, jobs 
working with the NAACP, uh, working with the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, she would travel in the South and meet uh, the kinds of people she was talking about as being the heart and soul and core of like successful movement organizing, the people on the ground. And um, that was brave work, that was valiant work. She, as I said, was a catalyst for the formation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, which is legendary, a legendary organization in the history of our nation, uh, an organization that transformed the nation. And um, she, you know, she was working with young people, and of course, young people were at the heart of the civil rights movement as well. And she really encouraged them to, be, to start an independent organization, not to be an auxiliary or a kind of a partner organization with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is where I believe she was working by that time, but to start their own organization. And she arranged for them to have a, a meeting at her historically black college, that is the college that she had attended, uh, and Shaw, I think it was Shaw University. And that's where uh, SNCC got its start. Um, the fact that she was multi-issue, the fact that she was respectful to uh, people who were the most oppressed and, and had respect for them um, and, and said that very clearly, that's the uh, sign. Those are the signs of a really powerful leader. It was not about her. It was about the, it was about making the change. And there was much change that needed to be made at that time. And still. She also was, inter also she was internationalist in her perspective. Yes. And I think that that's something that current movements are kind of building towards right now, which kind of just to switch gears just a little bit with this next question. Um, so you've spoken about the need for white activists to desegregate their personal lives in order to desegregate their political organizing. So how can white allies and activists begin to desegregate their personal lives in order to build the revolutionary interdependency that's necessary to further the work? And by the work, I just want to be explicit. I mean the work of Black organizers, Black feminist organizers, especially. Uh, the reason I talk about the need for people to, to desegregate their lives is that the way that people connect with each other generally is through associations that are not necessarily formed with a purpose. It's not like a business per se, you know, like in business, everybody who makes a particular product or who is in a certain kind of work, they may very well come together and find each other and meet each other. Uh, but if your work is social, economic, and racial justice, then how do you make that operational if you're doing it in a segregated context? One of the reasons that I began to notice this is that when I moved to Albany, New York in the mid eighties, I would go to events. The Central America Solidarity Movement was very strong at that time. And because there was so much disastrous action, there, there, were so, there were so many dis disastrous actions primarily carried out by the United States in what is now referred to as the Northern Triangle. Well, the ones that don't have close caption. Are we okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, now we're good, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, in any event, um, as I said, the Central America Solidarity Movement was very strong in the 1980s. And that's when I moved to Albany. And I would go to these events and I would look around and there'd be lots of people. Sometimes, you know, there would be a speaker from out of town, etc. 
and I look around and virtually everybody in the room was white. And it's just like, wait a minute, you know? And of course I had moved to Albany from New York City, which is very different demographically. And it began to occur to me that the reason that the, these uh, rooms and these meetings and these events were so white is that the white people there didn't hang out with any people of color. Because when you actually have people of color in your lives and you're doing something that's interesting, you know, or fun, interesting or fun, or, you know, somewhere in between, uh, when you're doing something, you might say to that person of color, hey, would you like to go to blah, 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 blah. I think you might enjoy this, you know, and then you do that. And then the events <laughs> became, become desegregated. Mm -hmm. But what I realized was that these white people were not in any way connected to people of color. And that to me is not defensible. Um, I think that because race is such a lightning rod, rod and like, let's not just say race, white supremacy. Uh, White supremacy, is not, that's not a lightning rod. That's like an operating system for the nation, you know? And having, you know, said, said that I wrote four articles starting around this time last year. Three of them are in the Boston Globe and one of them is in the nation. The last one I wrote after the uh, attack on the Capitol on January 6th, which was a white lynch mob, as far as I'm concerned. Many people understand that to be the case, a white supremacist lynch mob. But in any event, um, when, um, like, as I said, because of how fraught race relationships, uh, ra racial relationships, race, everything about race in the United States is like uh, the third, a third rail. It's just so volatile. People are so uncomfortable and so weary. And they, I think one of the things that white people might think is that, wow, you know, uh, we did a lot of things that were not the best things to be doing. So if I try to talk to somebody who has experienced those things, even though I personally was not involved in them, how might they receive me? Because if I were them, I think I'd be pretty angry <laughs> pissed <laughs> off. And I think that these gulfs among and between us, it takes some courage and it takes some integrity to reach across identities, to reach across chasms and boundaries. But if you know in your heart and in your also in your mind that you are coming from a good place, that's a real, really good step up into having a desegregated life. There are also decisions that people can make about where they live, where their children, if they have children, go to school, where they socialize, what they read, the kinds of films they go to see and the kind of music that they listen to or, or um, you know, go to see live. Mm -hmm. um, there are all kinds of decisions that people can make of like, I know I'm not on this planet by myself, but with only people like me. <laughs> and it's so therefore, perplexing. say that again, Maya. I said it, it's so perplexing to me that so many people in like when I, when you notice, well, at least I notice, why is your friend group all white? And they seem a little taken aback by it. And they're like, well, I mean, I don't know that many black, how am I supposed to know black people? Indefensible, indefensible. I'm sorry. I know, I know I'm not supposed to laugh my head off during this. No, session. no, we're, <laughs> this is a conversation. Well, the thing is, it is funny because there are quite a few of us, you know, there are quite a few of us. And then like, if you also, you know, embrace as I absolutely would, all of our, you know, communities of color. I mean, that's a lot of people of color. And in fact, as we know, the uh, demographers are telling us that pretty soon that people of European heritage in the United States are not going to be a numerical majority. And that is causing some consternation mm -hmm. among certain kinds of people because they want to hold on for dear life. Hence, we have 
people uh, who re will remain nameless who say things like make America great again, which of course we understood to mean make America white again. Um, and they're worried about that shift of like when the numbers change, but I, I don't know if I'll get into all uh, that, um, but and what I think about all that, I think I'll stop now. But the thing is, <laughs> but the thing is that I'll just make the original point. There are quite a few people of color to connect with. And I want to say this as an African American, that I have been challenged in my own life and out of my own politics to connect with other groups of people of color. And I face as a person from a particular heritage, a particular background, I face um, challenges and you know moments of like insecurity and taking risk. I face that too. So, and so do people who are not of African heritage living in the United States, but and who are people of color. So do they face? Like, how, how do we connect? One of the things that's so delightful about humans is that when, if, if you are not operating with toxic violence and hostility and contempt, that if humans, when they start talking to each other, they so quickly find the things that they have in common. It's just, if only that could be always the case. Um, and because we all have, we do have these similar experiences, you know, we were babies once, we were children, we have families, uh, we live somewhere, you know, we went some other places, you never know, you never know. And, you know, we, we like certain things, we don't like certain other things, I'm just talking about discretionary things mm -hmm. that don't really have much political impact one way or the other, you know. You know, you can like NASCAR or you can like the Boston Symphony, you know, who cares? <laughs> but the thing is that then you find out, well, I had this uncle, you know, and he was crazy about NASCAR. He was a black person. <laughs> and so, you know, there are all these delightful things that you find out, you know, that if you just talk about some basics, you might have the basis of a conversation. Now, not everybody is open uh, on our side, you know, not everybody who has been oppressed and, and, and not just oppressed, mistreated. I mean, we live in a nation where there are extra judicial killings of black and brown people and indigenous people, all kinds of people, Muslims too, Asian American and Asian Pacific Islander people too, all kinds of gratuitous violence against our peoples, our peoples, plural. I don't think I mentioned uh, Latinx people or Latino, Latina people, but all kinds of people are experiencing hate crimes and violence and sometimes uh, the most horrific of deaths. So given that that's the case, um, you you may not always get, you know, the open arm welcome mat, you know, reception. But if you're bond bonding around your political commitments, you should be able to figure that out. And be able to see past that kind of response sometimes from people of color. Because mm -hmm. I, think, I think that what a lot of white people don't realize is it's, it's rooted in experience. It's rooted in that kind of mistrust. It's rooted in experience. And Absolutely. Living day to day, minute to minute experience, Absolutely. experiencing different microaggressions. And yes. so I think that sometimes instead of looking at the picture more holistically and understanding where someone may be coming from, I think there's a tendency to internalize it and make it very personal. Right, right. Like, they and might... they... mm -hmm. so no, sorry. continue, continue. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and the thing is, you will find, you know, if, if you, you, you make your circles wide enough, you will find that there are uh, various different kinds of people who, with whom you have something in common. Mm -hmm. So like for those experiences that are really negative uh, 
and all putting, just as you're saying, Maya, do not judge uh, the, the possibility of being able to live that kind of a life a life of uh, uh, in community with all different kinds of people, don't base it on the first rebuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel fortunate that um, even though I grew up in segregation, I was born into Jim Crow, stuff was bad, <laughs> you know. Emmett, Kill, Emmett Till was murdered when I was eight years old. I mean, that's my life. Uh, the little girls in Birmingham were blown to, uh, to, uh, to bits in 1964, during my life, I was in high school. So, you know, it's not like bad things weren't happening, horrible things were happening. And those are just two uh, very, very uh, horrible specific examples. But the people in my family, even though they were from Georgia, uh, which was the worst state as far as lynchings, the number of lynchings in the, old, in the old Confederacy after Mississippi, numerically, it was Mississippi had the highest number of lynchings. And right after that, it was Georgia. Georgia was no joke. And none of those states were a joke. And there were lynchings where you are in yeah. Indiana. Not far from, from South Bend. Yeah, Ohio, where I'm from. I mean, that upper Midwest. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. But of course, it was concentrated in the South. And despite the fact that that's where my family came from, I grew up in Cleveland. Um, they basically kind of taught my sister and me to do like a case-by-case -case evaluation of everyone we met, whoever they were, whatever their background, a case-by-case -case evaluation. It, was, it has stood me in good stead to have that kind, of, that, that kind of role modeling because they kind of role model, modeled it too, even though it was a very segregated world. Uh, one of my family members did work in a situation where she was one of the few black people working in the situation at the time. And so, you know, we saw how she negotiated that. And, you know, she was not, you know, there were people there who were, she, she was, they were horrible to her. And as we got older, she would tell us that. This is our aunt, uh, uh, who I'm referring to, our one of our, our, our maternal aunt, we only had one maternal aunt. But anyway, you know, so it wasn't like she gave people like all this kind of slack if they were uh, abusive, but then there were a couple of people who she met who she actually became actual friends with. And that was really fascinating because we're talking about 1950s and early 60s. So as I said, I, I was kind of taught to do a case by case evaluation. I do have high standards. <laughs> As we all should, as we all should for the people we allow to be within our innermost circle and to share right. our lives with. All right. But I am, so I'm looking at the clock and because- I have we, been looking at it too. I know. And I'm like, I really, I don't want this conversation to end at all. It's, it's honestly, it's been very great, but I do in closing to kind of wrap, wrap all of this up. In your everyday life, what are small ways that you build and maintain community? Uh, I really like that question. I, I told you that when I emailed you, I put little asterisk, you know, stars <laughs> <laughs> by it because I liked it. Um, I feel like um, this has been a strange period for us because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. which is still in existence, hasn't ended. And one of the things that I've been aware of, even though it was true before, is that I um, have these really uh, wonderful relationships with younger people in the community who are politically uh, alert and interested, and um, they're very dear to me. And it's wonderful to have a friendship across a few generations some of these people are in their 20s. Yeah. And I mean, it's so uplifting to me to be um, accepted um, as a friend. And um, as I said, it's wonderful for me to have uh, that opportunity. And um, I think when we get back out in the world, uh, which you know, a lot of us are beginning to do, 
I haven't really gotten an announcement of any in-person meeting <laughs> yet. Um, but I think that um, when we are in struggle with uh, and struggle together, we also take time to um, do things that uplift our spirits. And so it's not enough just to do nothing but work all the time. And wh whatever it is, I was talking about different, you know, like I'm not about sports, uh, but you know, many people are. I mean, that might be the thing that you do together with people who you also sit in meetings with to try to plan how to make the community a better place or how to make the people who make the decisions or help the people who make the decisions to be better and do better. So you might end up going to a sport, sports event or to a party or to a, uh, you know, a celebration for uh, new babies or whatever it is that you're doing that's really human and that you get to see each other in uh, different uh, lights. Um, saying this or talking about this, I'm thinking about uh, Paul Mishler's brother, Mark, uh, and uh, who lives uh, here, and that's how we got connected. Um, he is uh, very involved in Jewish Voice for Peace, and I've been active in Jewish Voice for Peace, too, in the last couple of years. And uh, I guess it would have been in 2019 that we were able to have an in-person Seder, and it was a huge, huge, huge event with many, many moving parts. <laughs> and um, uh, Renee Harrington, who is Mark Mishler's partner, um, was very much at the helm of keeping all those moving parts together, as was the planning committee. Uh, I was not a part of the planning committee. I brought, I brought grape juice. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a role to play. We all have a part. Right, indeed. But be that as it may, you know, that was a wonderful time for us. And they were um, like, there was a dram dramatic performance. There was some music. Of course, there was food. It was just wonderful and fascinating. And of course, it was um, a, an observance out of the culture, you know, for some people, it was, uh, you know, tied to the, uh, to Ju Judaism, to the religion, but it was certainly uh, a celebration of Jewish uh, culture uh, and heritage. And it was just so wonderful that there was such a diverse uh, group of people who could experience that. And we, we, as I said, we do other things like that, maybe not as complicated <laughs> as that was, you know, um, picnics, you know, whatever it is, G going to see live music, you know, just all kinds of things. Uh, with people who we love and care about and that makes uh, you know that's what makes uh, it possible to get up in the morning and to uh, work another day well thank you for leaving us with that note with that just very positive note because I agree when you're able to be in community with people when you're able to do things other than the work with people that is how you can start to move things forward because you have a better understanding of who people are as individuals. And I'm looking at my phone, Maya. I'm sorry to be doing that, but I'm going over the questions yes. that we had you know, shared <laughs> before. And I just wanted to make sure that I think we got to everything except you had said when we spoke earlier today, you had said that uh, maybe I want to say something. I might want to say something about the Hamer Baker plan, and that was something I wrote about uh, in relationship uh, to the discussion we had about Ella Baker. That was something I wrote about last summer. It was an article that appeared in the Nation magazine where I actually proposed a plan for how to end white supremacy. Uh, no one has. Uh, I haven't got any phone calls uh, about uh, how uh, people who want to put that into uh, action, but it is written. It is in writing. Um, and a lot of people, comprehensive. Read, a lot of people, oh, it's not really, it's not really comprehensive. It was, it, it was an attempt. It was an attempt. It was, it was like a, a template, a beginning, but, and, but thank you for saying that. 
Um, but as I said, a lot of people uh, did indeed uh, read it. And in fact, you'd be interested in this. There's, a, there's at least one classroom that I'm aware of that used it for their kind of uh, project for uh, at least the semester, not the whole school year. And the uh, challenge uh, and the assignment was for the students who were, I'm pretty sure were high school students, was to develop their own plans uh, wow. for, ad for addressing white supremacy. And uh, one of the things about white supremacy that I see in relationship to that Hamer Baker plan is it had a beginning, it could have an end. But people have to think that way. And because it is so critical to how the status quo functions in the United States, the miserable racial context in which this country operates and seems to accept as being, well, that's just the way things are. Um, it's hard to get to that consensus of like, you know, we really are not doing very well here. We can, we can do a lot better if we would just begin to, to do, you know, to do true justice as opposed to, you know, that kind of paper thin, paper thin, yeah, that paper thin version of, of justice and freedom. So anyway, I think I'm done. Well, thank you. Thank you for that addition, because I don't think that a lot of people may have heard of the Hamer Baker plan. Um, I'll make sure that we put that on our blog and po post it on our social media as well for people to take a look at, because I think it is really important because it's looking at all these different areas of our lives and of this of this country that we should be actively working to change in order to have true equity and true democracy. And so I think that we're gonna get into a little bit of discussion and questions from, from some of the people in the audience. And I just wanted to say, my understanding is that this was not necessarily questions aimed at me, like a typical uh, or usual Q and A that is a chance for people to talk among yourselves. And I would really value yeah. hearing people talk among themselves. And if I feel like, I can jump in with something. I don't know how to raise my hand on Zoom, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little button right on the bottom. It should sit next to, um, I think it's, for me, it's next to the record button. You can hit raise hand. Okay, well, maybe because of what I'm using, I've not seen it, but uh, it'll, it'll turn out okay. All right, so. Day, was it you that was looking at some of the questions? It was me, yes. And there was, there was, a, there are a, a few questions that it would be great for us to be able to get to. And uh, also, I want to make note that for those people who are asking about closed captioning, uh, there was, there were technical problems with that. And the Black Lives Matter operations promises that for the recording of this evening's conversation, uh, there will be closed captions so that there'll be an opportunity for our viewers who, were, who have issues with hearing that they too will be able to take advantage of the conversation. And we apologize for those technical issues. The questions that were listed here that I, uh, there were a number of questions that have to do with the Kumbahi statement itself, asking if it is could still be seen as relevant to a new generation that may not be as schooled about socialism and therefore uh, may have a different take on the statement, even though there was a, a sense that it is it says as much now as it might have been. Uh, Comments, responses, Barbara Smith. Oh, were you asking Barbara that directly? That person was asking directly, yes. Ah, uh, okay. As I said, uh, I thought that we were gonna do something a bit different, which I was excited about, which is not having me answer. Why doesn't somebody who's on the Zoom say what they think about you know, you can, somebody else can answer that. <laughs> like, do, do you think that it's useful today? 
uh, given that uh, it's written from a socialist perspective? Well, I would argue that a socialist perspective is still, it's still very relevant today. I don't, I, I guess that's kind of where the disconnect is for me because it's, it's still something very, very relevant to a large portion of Americans. And I mean, we even saw that with, where we had kind of a democratic socialist uh, candidate running for office that had a lot of widespread support. And so I, I do think that socialism as so many black organizers have said before all of them that that is the only way forward that's the only way towards progress because that's the only thing that can guarantee equity for all people okay. all right other other questions that are listed here uh, there is a question about how can we address and begin to merge the disconnect that's seen within the Black activist community and the Black queer community? And that is a general question. Do you have anything to add to that day? Or Paul, Paul's got his hand up. Ooh. Oh, I would love to hear from Paul. Paul unmute himself. Well. Yes, he can. get myself in. Um, yeah, I, I thought I would respond to the question of, of socialism, and I think um, there's clearly a lot to be said and writ read about a tradi this tradition. But one of the things about, you know, rereading Combahee River Collective Statement and that context in Boston when it was written in where I lived at the time and was very active is the recognition of how suppressed it's been. So when we say, well, our students don't, any, don't know anything about it or have no conception of what it is, don't even know where to begin. This is not just, God, I missed it. I forgot. I didn't, I don't like, I didn't know anything about, it. you know, peanut butter and a sort of, this is, in my experience, this was actively suppressed. And we see it in, let's say, in universities and in teaching staff where people with socialist ideas have been pretty much excluded, contrary to what the right says, who thinks we're all you know, indoctrinating our students. It's, you know, I wish it were true, but it, it's not. And they, that the suppression of that, I mean, I always encourage people to go back, not only reading the Kambabe River Collective Statement, but the whole discussion that's taking place, that takes place within this multifaceted left. And I also, I can speak from Boston. I mean, the Socialist Feminist and the organization was called Bread and Roses was a mass organization of, of socialist women, um, some of whom I was lucky enough to be friends with and have them as teachers. So the, that the recognition, like there's been a lot of re recognition about how histories have been suppressed, about African-Americans, about queer people, about all kinds of how the, the histories have been in denial. But I think it's a little dangerous when that the thing that's left it's sort of portrayed as, well, this doesn't have anything to do with us. Numbers of people say socialism doesn't have anything to say to black people. Socialism doesn't have anything to say to women. When, you know, outside of a few people, the socialists were the first people to raise the issue of women's rights in Europe and the United States. So the store, the way it's done, it's not like the old Red Scare where I said, well, don't listen to them, they're all crazy. This is addressed to movement activists saying, don't go here. And it's worth asking why the people in power can accept some forms of struggle, mostly those struggles about inclusion at the top so that it fits into their opportunity model and don't wanna have us talking about a totally renovation of a new society. That's what they don't want. They don't wanna say, no, we really do think that it doesn't really matter if there's a woman CEO. What it really matters is if all women are earning enough to support themselves and their children, because that's what they're not gonna do. They'll let somebody in at the top to make it so it looks good, but they won't say, what about people who are struggling? All of them. And how do we do that? That's, that suppression is very important. Then here in Michiana, for example, in the two universities that are important here, Notre Dame and, and Indiana University, that for example, the economics department were very, very, explicit in the exclusion of a left left-wing economists in Notre Dame they were fired on mass about 10 years ago 
And in Notre Dame, they, in IUSB, they moved the economics department from liberal arts to the business school. So if you're a young faculty member in economics, you're not gonna get tenure by being a socialist, not if you're in the business school, because they don't want people to criticize them, right? So this has been a very explicit um, exclusion within the academy and then becomes permeated is that nobody really hears that. So I would, you know, I would encourage everybody who's interested in anti-racism and anti-sexism to see what intersectionality and what these new recognitions of the different ways that oppression plays out, how do we begin to look toward a future that's different? So that's my answer. <laughs> we have a question here in the Q&A. Uh, the attendance says, uh, my church is located in a wealthy white neighborhood. I was decorating the church mailbox this past Christmas and the old white man drove up, stopped his car and started yelling. Uh, I never thought I'd see a day a communist banner would be in this neighborhood. Unfortunately, my response of go back on your meds was not educated or helpful. <laughs> what would be a better response? Hmm. Oh, I want to encourage, is everybody allowed to talk on this? I yeah. mean, does everybody I mean, have the capacity I'm, to talk? As in the participants? Attendees? Are attendees able to raise their hands? Yeah. They are able That's to what I'm asking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's a raise. So I think that other people, yeah. So somebody responded to that. Uh, it says we as attendees are not able to talk. Attendees cannot unmute. Okay. That was. All right. I see. Oh, right able. Okay. They said that they can make attendees able to talk. Wonderful. Beautiful. Okay. I'd love right. to hear from. Yeah. I'd love to hear from some attendees and be able to. Oh. I see a hand raised. What I don't see is whose it is. Hold on. Betterman? Yeah, but Paul Paul made my uh, argument better better than I did. Um, I just find my my students love Kambahi. They've become, you know, that whole vision of race and gender is exactly where they're going. It's in, intuitive to them. It's natural. But it just seems to me if you leave out the socialism, it means something very different from what you meant when you put it together. You know, I almost want to challenge, channel you as a young person talking to people who get the race and gender part, but who think, but who really think in terms of liberalism, whether they, they know it or not. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Could you say something? Like, what do we do with it? I, yeah, I would like to, are you asking if I would say something? Yeah, because I don't know. I mean, I would, like, I would like to say something. Yes. Okay. I'm done now. Well, what I was going to say is that there's a lot of uh, confusion and false consciousness, of, uh, uh, as we would expect, uh, under this kind of uh, system. And like back in my day, the people who were considered to be heroic were uh, people who were in leadership of the struggle, the freedom struggle. So there's a real difference when the people you're looking up to are sacrificing and risking their lives in order for the whole collective community to be free and people whose claim to frame is that they're cajillionaires because they're very successful entertainers or, or athletes. That's a very, very different mentality. And then reality TV, I mean, as if things were not bad enough already. Uh, you have people who it's, uh, it's about materialism. It's about being really uh, self-centered and petty and just not even not, like no role models. I mean, I grew up at a time when you could actually see James Baldwin on television. Think about it. <laughs> he, he wasn't on often, mm -hmm. but what he was, it was a big event. Mm -hmm. And that shaped consciousness. So, I mean, I think that our job uh, is to try to provide opportunities for people to look at things in 
more nuanced ways. And I, I never really, my agenda is never to impose my political beliefs and perspectives on other people. That's not the work as far as I'm concerned. The work is the work. So when I was, for example, a twice elected member of our city council in Albany, I wasn't like, you know, getting up on soapboxes or standing up at council meetings and telling people all the, all the things that I thought I knew, which is not that much, but all the things that I thought I knew about what um, the struggle should be. It wasn't relevant. It was not relevant. As I said, that's not really what we're trying to do. I was concerned about the fact that there was a, a huge amount of gun violence in our city. And there, and there still is, unfortunately. But there were some things that we were able to do during the, that time. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh, there you are. OK, you're back. I'm sorry that happened. No. Um, it is the but in any is. event, like, you know, there were things that we were able to put in place at that time, uh, during that time that did address real concerns and real issues. I also did a lot of stuff in our education, our public school uh, system to try to get better results and, uh, and opportunities there. So, um, I mean, my perspectives and my experiences are mine and they motivate me, but I'm not like, I'm not doctrinaire about mm -hmm. like, if you don't believe like this, then, you know, we cross you off a list or something like mm -hmm. that. That's not how you build. That's really not how you build. Mm -hmm. You build through doing that work of, a ju of, of, of more justice, building more justice and more peace. We have a hand raised from Rebecca Gordon. Rebecca, are you still with us? You, okay, now you're muted. Yes, now I have access to my mute button. Hi, hello, Barbara. Um, no, I just, I was fascinated by the conversation we were having in the chat and also listening to Paul talk about trying to talk about economic and class issues in, in a college teaching setting. And I was just saying that one of the experiences I've been privileged to have is teaching classes of mostly young people of color who have been minoring in community engaged learning, which means they work in local community based organizations. And we've, we've focused the whole course on work, paid work, unpaid work, what is the meaning of work in our lives and like, you know, Marx back there said that our species nature as human beings is that we make things that and that we we do things. And so I, I found that um, they're absolutely sort of reflexively almost anti-capitalist, but there's not, there's not any sort of picture of where to go with that beyond just being upset about capitalism, which is totally appropriate. <laughs> and by starting to talk about their experiences of work and their families' experiences of work, we're able to sort of start to build an analysis of like, where does the profit come from? when you work for somebody where, you know, and, and get this picture of where profit might come from, for example. And it's just been, it's been so moving and rich for me and I hope it's been useful to them. So that's just one strategy I've used. Okay. Thank you. And I see Jerry's hand up. Thank you are muted, Jerry. Uh, Hello, Barbara Smith is so great. I was doing anti-racist organizing with the Boston Alliance, Mel King and Margaret Burnham when Kumbahi came out. And it was amazing to me, not just, it, it became a template because black feminists 
and lesbian women articulated differences in what their experience of racism and male supremacy is. And I had grown up thinking I was poor. I didn't know, but if you want to talk about socialism, you have to understand that there are classes in America and there's a working class and a ruling class and a middle class. It's all kind of goofy. And the point is, that's what I got from the black feminist writings that it's that because I felt I came in and was thinking okay about the women's movement, but they stayed too much time in consciousness raising and not doing action a lot, right? And I felt they kind of got hijacked by middle-class white women and I didn't have a place. And then when, when Kumbaya River Collective came out and the other writings, you see, I realized, oh, I get it. Working class women can also think about how they are their positionality articulates with racism and also with class bias and with male supremacy. So it was a wonderful, I mean, I don't, I know that is not why you started the work, but you see how it just, it just, it, well, it really moved me, inspired me and made me feel like, oh, I'm not like some an oddball. I don't fit into the women's movement. I just have a different take on it. And a lot of us working class gals ended up working in the labor movement, but being anti-racist wherever we go, because that's the foundational issue in the United States. As a woman and as a working class gal, racism is the most important thing for us to do. And it's not exclusionary. It's just, you have to have that basis with all the stuff we do. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Shantoria, your hand is up. Oh, don't forget to mute again, Jerry. Yeah. We see your hand. You don't see, yeah, okay. We don't hear you. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay, perfect. It's loading now on my end. Um, hello, hello, um, uh, Dr. Smith. Um, I studied your work um, in grad school, so it's really, really a privilege to sit here and listen to you. Um, my question is, is I'm a Black educator now through a organization that is very tight in how they control the, um, the way that we teach and what we teach. Um, and I've been trying to create an access where I am introducing my students to um, ways um, to feminism, understanding Black feminism, understanding what intersectionality is, and they really have had no access to this information. And I'm really finding myself stuck um, of creating, not just exposing them to this literature, but how do I start from scratch? Um, I'm teaching um, all black students in a poor black community. I'm from this community. And although I'm myself going through this uh, material, right, um, as a student and as an educator, I still find myself really faced with a wall, right? Because not only do the students not know what I'm talking about, I also face backlash from the education institution. So how do I begin to merge um, my students' minds and this material that you have so brilliantly talked about today? Like, how do I create that uh, connection and open uh, up that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Not a doctor. <laughs> I explained that uh, before. Uh, uh, we, I think it was. Is it D? Uh, that said that. Uh -huh. Because you are a doctor um, in our in our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> it's because of all that book learning. But anyway, anyway. Um, what a challenge, and that was a great question uh, that you asked. Um, you, one, one thing of, as far as your work situation, try to find at least one uh, ally, or if possible, more than one, people who are interested in the same kinds of teaching that you are interested in, and um, so that you can be supports to each other when there are people who wish to attack and, and don't uh, understand what you're trying to do. Another thing, I just fall back on my liter literature background is that instead of, I wouldn't be giving, what, what, uh, well, I don't know that you can, you can do a back and forth, so I'm not sure what grades uh, you, you are teaching, is if it's elementary, middle school, but whatever it is, you know, any of the, K through uh, 12, I got the impression it is K through 12. Um, I would give them stories or either history, history or stories that they can relate to because there's something in the stories slash history that they uh, can identify with and that they can, 
you know, begin, you can talk about the political ideas through the stories that grab them or the poems, the poetry that grabs them. I don't know if that's something that you've done previously, but I found teaching African-American literature uh, one of the joys of my life in general. But one of the things that was so wonderful about it is that it was such a pathway into having those kinds of really meaningful and rich discussions about what's it like to be an X or what's it like to be a Y? What's it, li what's it like, you know? I mean, there's nothing like reading a story, uh, short story, novel, poem, that you find out about ways of thinking about the world and seeing the world in beautiful language, in beautiful and creative language that you wouldn't have thought about it the same way before. So I would use, you know, instead of like taking them right to the political analysis, I would give them some stories that illustrate what it is you want them to know uh, and some of the ideas that you want them to know. So I don't know if that is helpful because I'm not giving you particular citations, but like, well, there's one novel I'll mention that is so useful to me. Uh, I loved it. It was so useful in my teaching. And that's uh, is one of my favorite novels uh, of all time. It's a novel called, uh, titled The Street, The Street by Anne Petre. And it's about a young black woman who was raising her son by herself after her marriage uh, uh, did not work out. And the reason her marriage did not work out really had to do with economic issues. And uh, I'm not doing spot uh, plot spoiling or anything, but it's a, another one of those pieces of writing that it could have been written yesterday. It actually takes place in the 1940s in Harlem, but a, an incredibly vivid character, an incredible story. And also it's a novel, it's by Anne Petrie. I should say who it's by. Uh, it's by Anne Petrie, and it, uh, it focuses on not just the racial and economic class dimensions of what the main character, whose name is Lutie Johnson, doesn't just fo focus on those dimensions, it focuses on the gender dimensions of what she is experiencing as well. It's just a phenomenal book, and I think that a lot of, it, it, depending on what age, your students are, it's something that they can relate to if they are high school age readers. Um, and then for the younger students, I guess I'm giving you all kinds of, um, I think I'm seeing in the chat, but I missed it, um, what, what age group, but for the younger students, I would give them some uh, bi biographies, you know, introduce them to some people like them from other centuries and other places who are going through things and who went through things similar to what they're uh, dealing with. So there's some wonderful, uh, there's wonderful young adult literature that really gets into great issues as well. All right. I'm and gonna, then you can talk to them about the politics. <laughs> I'm going to dive in here. Uh, I feel the tyranny of the clock. Uh, we are That's moving in on the last couple of minutes of our time with Barbara Smith. I want to assure those of you who have dropped questions into chat and into Q&A, and, and I'm loving that we're seeing so many of them, your questions will not be lost. I will drop into chat myself. The uh, URL for our community commons, and I encourage you to move your questions to the commons uh, so that we can continue our conversation so we can begin talking about what do we see as an action step that we could take from here. And I will, and that will allow us to cover all of these questions that we weren't able to in the time that we have right now. Uh, to offer a little bit of a tidbit for those of you who have joined us, we will have a soft stop here. Uh, for those of you who have something else you need to do at eight o'clock, uh, we are officially done for, uh, and therefore you can go do those things and feel no, and not wonder if you're missing something. Uh, if you have a few minutes and you'd like to stay for a little bit longer to continue the conversation, perhaps Barbara Smith will not be able to stay with us, but we can continue this conversation ourselves, uh, but we will have a hard stop at 815. 
so that uh, we can, the rest of us can go on with the other things that we have for this evening. Uh, I would like to thank you, Barbara Smith, and you are always a doctor in my mind and to the minds of many of us uh, for the incredible work that you've done in your lifetime, uh, continuing to do even here in the new millenn in the new century. And it was an honor and a pleasure to hear you talk and have a conversation with one of our new educators, Maya Perry, who is going out into the world of education and will do us honor, I am very sure. Uh, so for those of you who, who feel the need to go now, uh, feel free to do that. And we will stay on, as I said, for uh, until about 8.15 when we will all go away. Uh, and, and so uh, with that thought. And may, and may I just uh, respond? I wanted yes. to say something. Yes. I, want, I wanted to thank everyone. Um, and I, you've done a beautiful job, Dee, and so did Maya and uh, other people who I haven't met. Um, all of you who made this possible, it's been uh, quite a joy for me. And I did want to ask, was it, would it be possible to save the chat so that I could see some of the responses because I'm not seeing most of them as we have uh, gone through this evening. I'm going to hang out for just a little bit longer and I may get off before 8.15, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. so you got me. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Uh, so I saw in the chat that uh, Otrude Moyo, are you still with us? Yours was the next person in the lineup. There she is, yes. Hello. Hello, yes, we can hear you. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking uh, for taking me. I would like to thank you and the panelists for um, uh, having uh, this wonderful, great conversation that is energizing us uh, to move forward in that mindfulness for community. I am thankful. That's all that I can say for now, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Awesome experience. Okay, do we have other I, questions? Before we get to the questions, I do want to make sure that I mention some things that are going on in South Bend, uh, especially as we're talking about what it means to move the work forward. Um, so right now, um, those of you that are in South Bend, um, please, please, please check out the Alliance uh, the Michigan Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression's Facebook page, as well as Black Lives Matter South Bend's Facebook page for updates on what we're doing around our campaign to get SROs out of schools. Uh, we also have a Juneteenth celebration going on at Howard Park on Juneteenth. Um, we hope to see you all there. On our Facebook, there is a link for the Eventbrite. There are free tickets. We just wanna make sure that everyone is signing up so we know who's gonna be there. These are for safety concerns as well. So make sure that you get your ticket because we would love to be there with you all and celebrate and talk about how we can get some things done in South Bend. In the spirit of creating alliances, tell all of us because some may not know when Juneteenth is. Oh, on the 19th, on Saturday, June 19th. We will be communing in the park. We will have, um, we're gonna have a car show. We're gonna have a three on three basketball tournament. We're going to have a black history scavenger hunt, lots of activities for kids and just an opportunity for us to be with one another and for people to get more involved in both the Alliance and Black Lives Matter because we have so many things that we would love to do but we also, we need to be working together to make these things happen. So I just wanted to kind of put that little plug in there before we go on to anything else. Great, great. It's good to know all the things that are going on around the city. Uh, let's see, Helen Claire, you have your hand up there. If you are speaking, we can't hear you. You have to unmute. Helen. Yeah. Am I unmuted now? Now we can you hear are. you. Yes. All right, yay, hallelujah. <laughs> all, I was, all I was doing was two things. I was responding to the one lady that uh, was decorating at the, at the church and the man came by and was quite rude and she asked the question, what would you say? 
and I'm answering what I I, I, I typed it in, but I, I guess it didn't get sent. My answer to that would have been that I would have turned around and wished him a Merry Christmas and told him I loved him. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would have said. Mm -hmm. And then to Barbara, since she's still hanging around, everything was very wonderful and lovely. And I want to tell you, uh, you keep talking about your age. I'm older than you by many years. <laughs> but I feel young like these young women that I'm watching tonight. And thank you very much. And I've really enjoyed this. I happen to be a white woman that's very much into this. Uh, uh, I've been raised, um, I was raised as a child and I had neighbor, my neighborhood friends were also black. And so I really, uh, as you say, how your community brings you together is how you feel in life. And because I was raised also, um, um, my high school yearbook is uh, has um, Latinos and blacks and whites. It was a very mixed um, uh, high school. I go through life I don't see race. I, you know, everybody is just my friend. And wouldn't that have been nice? A woman my age, if all the children of the world at my age in this country had that wonderful experience, and we wouldn't be where we are now. And that's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, so I'm saddened. But I will work with. I'm here in West Virginia. I don't know how I got into your Indiana thing, but hey, I'm here. And I'm working with you and for you. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I am checking my various buckets here. I know, there's so, so much to look at. <laughs> there's so much to look at. I want to, I'm trying hard not to overlook something or someone. Uh, my chat is up, my q and A. I I don't see additional questions in the Q&A. Oh, um, here's a question that was a little earlier. I want to widen my social circle, but worry about tokenizing Black BIPOC, BIPOC. Black Indigenous people of color, people I make friends with, when broadening my circle with intent. Any advice on ways I could check myself to make sure this is not underlying future relationships, this being tokenizing? Uh, at least, I mean, I, I kind of have something to say about that. I think that it's more tokenization if you are seeking out people specifically uh, because of their, their blackness uh, or their, you know, their racialized identity. Um, I, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but it's so important to get involved with people because you are politically aligned with them. And I think that if you are making relationships with people from the standpoint of we are aligned on this issue, this is something that I deeply care about, this is something that you deeply care, care about, let's work on this together instead of just simply seeking out Black people, Indigenous people, people of color, because that's that it's that's kind of that singular identity focus that is so narrow, and it's it's not doing anything for us. So I think that what you need to do first is to be working within the kind of organizations, doing the kind of community work, um, and speaking to people about the issues that matter to you. And those people are bound to be from various different backgrounds. I see a comment here in chat that is agreeing. Uh, my students tell me that they are exhausted from people asking them, or they're exhausted by white students who need a black student friend. So I, I, there is much agreement on that, on that question. Okay, let's see. Um, 
we didn't get to speak about full, we didn't get to speak fully about relationships between LGBTQI Black people and Black Lives Matter. I want to share that we are hosting, and the rest is underneath there. And I can't, I can't find who wrote this. Is that person still here? Because I can't see the rest of that. Oh, it was Jerry. I can see it. It says, uh, oh, she's talking about the picnic. Wants to share that we're hosting a friends and family picnic in the park, um, a pride picnic in the park to celebrate pride. So fighting homophobia is a struggle for us all. Uh, oh, yes. Also, BLM South Bend hosted a mixer, a social gathering for young people of color at our at our Ashe house. So that was something that. That was great. That I, yes, it was a wonderful, was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful event that I in May. Um, so if you are in the area, I know that a lot of people joined us from all over because this was promoted through the Black Lives Matter Global Network as well. But especially if you're in South Bend, please get involved with us. We want to do so much. It's one of our seven pillars of Black Lives Matter is that queer Black Lives Matter. And so we want to be able to have more opportunities to get together and kind of integrate those things if you will because so and I, and I don't even like the characterization of like integrating you know black and lgbtq because there are black people that are queer and so and those identities are not able to be separated from one another so I don't really see it as um different communities um because it is you know it is my community and so if you are interested in getting involved with um more more queer centric and queer focused events in South Bend, please reach out to us. Those are the kind of things that we champion in Black Lives Matter and are looking to empower people um, to, to do more. And so you have our full support and we will be right here with you. I, I will probably be right there next to you, uh -huh. um, working on it with you. <laughs> that is an excellent point to stop it for our stopping for our hard stop. Uh, thank you for those of you who stayed with us. I'm looking down here at participants, 75 of us stayed on the call for a few more minutes because we wanted to eke out as much as we possibly could from this time we have together. Thank you again, Barbara Smith, for joining us. Thank you, uh, BLM South Bend, as well as the Michiana Alliance for co-sponsoring with us for this amazing event. Please. Once again, go to our community commons page. We set that up very specifically so that we would be able to continue this conversation and talk about, so what will we do next? I've dropped the link to that into chat so that you can go and, and navigate on the page to see all the things that you could be doing to become involved. Please write, upload your art, upload the other, uh, any words or essays. Please don't tell yourself, I don't have that much to say, please upload, let us hear from you. That's what it takes for us to be able to do this type of organizing, as well as for us to be able to invite as many people into this alliance as we possibly can. So with that, I will say good night. And I think it's good night on all parts of the, on all, most of the parts of the globe. Good day, good evening, or good night, wherever it is you are. And we will talk with you again at some later time. Uh, from those of us at Black Lives Matter South Bend, and the Michiana Alliance Against Racial and Political Repression. Bye-bye. Good night.